Urgent just wants to and this is the most gangster general of the American Revolution, Daniel Morgan. That's in a fact, Russian. I've been waiting for this video. Yeah, the Mel Gibson video from the Patriot. Patriot, yeah, Patriot? Yeah, that's the movie, right? I watched the movie, I don't know, like a million times in the, when I was a kid. It was like one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Uh, Mel Gibson and like this, these are the actors that you watch, right? It's, I don't know if he's before my time or what, but you know, he's, he's one of those actors that you watch, right? Yeah, there's him like, you know, Tom Cruise, Brad, you know, Brad Pitt and shit like that. But yeah, Mel Gibson and his movies, right? So, and also like TV ran a lot of these movies a lot. Yeah, where I live, uh, when I was a kid, I remember that. So I used to watch a lot of it, right? It was a fun movie, but uh, I always assumed that this is like over the top, probably not real story. Then one of the stories, uh, the factorian covered, and I, wait a minute, is this the same as like the, uh, you know, Mel Gibson movie one? Then he said, no, no, this is not that one. But there is a story, uh, you know, there's an actual story. Who's that movie based on? I'm like, what the hell? He basically talked about Daniel Morgan. And he didn't make the video about it. And I remember thinking like, he better make a video about it because that's going to be so good. There you go. He made a video about it. Of course he did. So yeah, this is a factorian video. Uh, obviously, it's going to be awesome. Factorian has this strength where, where he can just like tell you a story. And he's, he's a storyteller, right? That's not some small thing. You really need to know what to say, how to say it. And like, uh, if somebody else just sat there and just told you a story, you're like, well, what you're doing there? It's not fun. But the way Factorian tells it is just awesome, right? He just like builds the whole scene. Uh, he basically makes you believe every single moment and makes it exciting, right? So this is going to be awesome. That's what you did. Remember, if you like my reaction, don't forget to subscribe so that way I know which type of videos to react tomorrow. Uh, I like watching stories like that because uh, it, it, it really breaks my, uh, how do you say, like, reality of things, how I perceive things. Because, uh, you know, after like, uh, you know, like absorbing a lot of information every day, every time I make video, people always like, how do you know all this stuff? Like, my general knowledge is really vast, let's just say. And only thing that I gather from all that is usually cynicism, right? Uh, so I'm always like, oh, come on, this is not real. Oh, come on, the, in real life shit like that doesn't happen. Factories and stories always break that element in my head, right? And makes me think, wait a minute, bad shit like that can happen, right? And there, there have been too many stories, real stories like that, documented stories. This is another one I'm guessing. So, yeah, I love watching factories and videos. Uh, also, the like Count Dankula. What was the channel's name? Mad Lads, plus something like that, I don't know. Count Dangan Mad Lads, something. So he also covers stories like that. So if you haven't seen those reactions I did, check out the link in the description or in the end of the video end card. And yeah, let's do it. Benjamin Martin, a.k.a. Mel Gibson's character in the movie The Patriot, is very, very loosely based on the culmination of about five different American revolutionary fighters like Andrew loosely. Pickens, Thomas Sumner, Elijah Clark, Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, and this man. I mean, loosely, I guess it makes sense loosely because he d he does too much incredible shit. It's like a video game level shit, right? Single-handedly. So it kind of makes sense. Five guys, yeah. Today we're talking about the most gangster general of the American Revolutionary War, the undignified gorilla, Daniel Morgan. During the American Revolutionary War, General George Washington would take all of the riflemen that none of his other officers wanted, put them into one unit called the Provisional Rifle Corps, and put them under the command of Daniel Morgan, a man whose battle tactics George Washington described as undignified. They quickly adopted the name Morgan's Riflemen and became known for their guerrilla warfare tactics of hiding in trees, picking off high-ranking officers, and disrupting enemy supply lines. According to General Horatio Gates, Morgan's Rifles was the American Army Corps that the British military feared the most. They are the primary reason for the American victories at Saratoga and the Battle of Cowpens, probably the two most important battles of the revolution, responsible for turning the entire tide of the war. And we're gonna get into it right after a word from our sponsor. Delete me! Two, huh? Yeah. How do they do it in the movies? They they don't. No, nobody does that in real life. Yes, they do. No, they don't. We'll talk to Keanu Reeves. That's a movie. Yeah, but he does it in real life. All right, just just put him on the couch. Love you. Huh. 
This video is brought to you by Delete Me, super straightforward business. You give them money, they turn around and they make sure the data brokers on the internet are not selling your personal information. Simply put, pretty much any time you go on the internet and you fill out your personal information and you check that little box that says, I agree to the terms of service, those terms more than likely mean that they're collecting your personal data. They turn around and they sell that data to data brokers and then the data brokers sell it to whoever. The good news is these data brokers are legally required to get rid of your information and stop selling it if you ask them to. The hard part is figuring out which data brokers have your info and then filling out all the paperwork to get them to stop selling it. And that's where Delete Me comes in. Once you're using their service, they go through, they check all the data brokers for your personal information. And if they have it, they go ahead and they fill out all the paperwork to have that information taken down automatically. After that, they continue to keep checking and rechecking all these data brokers in case they somehow acquire your information again and start selling it again and make sure that doesn't happen. So if privacy sounds pretty cool to you, go ahead and check out Delete Me. I'll have a link and a discount code down below. Let's get back to the video. This is about the aiming thing that she was talking about. Um, how do people like, aim two guns in that movie? So that's basically bullshit, right? Like, how do you aim two guns when shooting? It's like, you shoot one, then you shoot another. Might as well shoot with the one gun. I mean, back then when there was like pistols, like slow firing revolvers, it made shen with, the, you know, like two guns because one is not fast enough. But nowadays, like two proper pistols, like HNK or something like that, right? Why the fuck would you need two? All right, our story begins in 1736 ish. We don't really know when he was born. We also don't really know where he was born. We know that he was born in either New Jersey or somewhere in Pennsylvania. We do know, however, that he's a big dude. He is described anywhere from being six foot to six foot four and built like a brick shit house by today's standards. And by 1740 standards, this dude's basically a giant. He doesn't really start popping. Yeah, back then, like, I mean, you know, yeah, people are getting bigger and bigger, right? Over time, right? Like uh, 2000 years ago, people used to be much shorter and shit like that, basically. So back then being six foot or six foot plus basically means six and a half foot or something. Right nowadays, like NBA level shit, NBA players and things like that, orderly wrestlers up in historical records until he's 16 or 17 years old and that actually happens in the Shenandoah Valley of Fredericks County, Virginia. Now this is actually a bigger deal than a lot of people might realize, okay? Because at the age of 16 or 17, Morgan got in an argument with his father, ends up leaving home, going out on his own, which is fairly normal, but he went to Virginia, which in the 1730s, 40s, 50s, Virginia is still very much the wild frontier at this point. Now that sounds a little bit strange to some people because when you hear the wild frontier, most people instinctively think of westward expansion. They're thinking, of like cowboys and Indians and pioneers and the Oregon Trail and the Wild Gold West. Rush. Okay, westward expansion is not going to start till 1803 and that's going to go on for a century after that. This is the mid 1700s. Virginia and everything south of it is still very, very much the wild frontier. So for a 17 year old to get in a fight with his old man and be like, oh yeah, screw you, dad. I'm going to go live in the modern day. Yeah, I mean, back then America was like very different, isn't it? Like America was kind of like new, at least you felt it as that way, and it was very much frontier, like America was developing, right? It was like the colonies and like, uh, you know, like the states slowly joining in as a union, right? The slowly states got added in, like everything was a frontier, so it was a very different feel than people have today equivalent of the Thunderdome is pretty telling of Morgan's character and quite honestly foreshadowing for the rest of his life story. And just to be clear, when I say that he first starts showing up in the historical record around this point in his life, the historical record that I'm referring to is the general store credit line in Winchester, Virginia, where he pretty much exclusively bought alcohol and playing cards. But wait! And the Frederick County Courthouse records where he was repeatedly sued for assault, basically for getting in bar fights and beating the shit out of people. Now, again, that sounds pretty weird because usually you would get arrested for getting in a bar fight and beating the shit out of somebody. But remember, it's Virginia and it's the wild frontier, okay? They don't really have much law enforcement to speak of. Really, the only reason that there's court records is there's one day a month in Colonial Virginia where they have the court day and they basically shut down the entire town. The whole town shows up to watch all of the legal proceedings for the entire month. And then whenever you have an issue with somebody, you just sue them in court. So yeah, it's pretty hard to get arrested on Wild Frontier. I mean, you basically got to murder somebody. And even then it's like, I mean, was he asking for it? What happened? Well, first of all, your honor, this motherfucker was going five miles an hour below the speed limit in the left lane of the Oregon Trail, which is outrageous because everybody knows the left lane is for crime. Then we finally get into town. I'm late because he won't get his wagon out of my way. He comes up to a red light and then he just sits there. There's no traffic. He's turning right and doesn't go right on a red. He sits there and he waits till a green, at which point I got out. I beat the shit out of him. I don't know what happened. He fell down. He turned blue. And now here we are. To which the judge is probably like, yeah, we're definitely better off without that guy. Innocent, free to go. 
Buh! There was no left lane in the Oregon Trail and there was no stoplights in Colonial Virginia in the 1700s. Buh! Yeah, it's a joke. Shut up. Anyways, in addition to drinking, gambling, and fighting all the time, he's also working extremely hard as a wagoner on the frontier. Like, yeah, more than that, like back then, right? Uh, like Fatrison says, like everything was kind of like loose because people are figuring shit out. Nowadays, like uh, the technology we have, like how we can track things and just... We have this assumption today, basically even then, like I'm going to say, like there's asterisks on top. We can basically catch anyone, figure anything out. And it makes sense in the modern time with asterisks on top, let's just say, too many unsolved things. But back then, it's just like horses and shit, like front, you know, like there's barely any road people seen like wild west how shit works right those movies and things right uh, how outlaws are and things like that barely like you know law is trying to catch them can't do that because sometimes you can even out outpower a law let's just say so at best you have like a bounty on you and shit like that this is before that time so you know like it's different time than today let's just say He's literally being commissioned by other people to drive wagons through uncharted territory. It's a pretty dangerous job for a 17 year old and he does that for years until he saves up enough money to actually end up buying his own wagon and going into business for himself. So by the time that he's like 19 or 20, he owns his own wagon and the British military is actually looking to hire civilians that have wagons and commission them to haul British supplies for the French and Indian War and Daniel Morgan agrees to do it. During the French and Indian War, Morgan gets his first taste of battle. That's where he first gets to see how combat is done and he's not watching conventional combat of the time where it's just one big rank and file of the military walking up to another one pointing guns at each other and shooting no this is a lot of native american combat where the native americans are using what we would define today as guerrilla tactics where they're simply just fighting to win not fighting to maintain their honor or whatever silly shit the british believe in now despite the french and the native americans actually trying to kill him the real yeah i mean you're just trying to survive at that point so like honor on the like let's just win let's just breathe another day honor and shit let, let, let's not even think about that problem morgan runs into in the french and indian war is the british themselves the people that he's working for the team that he is on okay because he's technically like a civilian contractor in today's terms the british military looks down on him they treat all these guys like absolute dog shit and one day one of the british officers is kind of talking down to daniel morgan he's talking smack at which point Daniel Morgan, being the defiant rebel that he is, immediately talks smack back. And the British officer draws his saber and smacks Morgan across the face with the flat side of the sword. At which point Morgan gets off his wagon and knocks this British officer out. Oh, shit! Now, this is a huge problem because while he's technically not part of the British military, as far as the British military is concerned, he's still subject to British military punishment. And Daniel Morgan is sentenced to 500 lashes, which essentially is a death sentence. They're just not coming out and saying it. They string him up and they lash him 500 times. According to legend and Daniel Morgan himself, he stayed conscious the entire time, counting the lashes along with the drummer boy as they whipped him. Not only did Daniel Morgan survive this death sentence, but he actually claimed for the rest of his life that the British only counted to 499 and that they still owed him one. So obviously Daniel Morgan doesn't really- Okay, that's some next little shit, 500 lashes. Yeah, I was, I'm surprised he didn't get like infection and died from sepsis or something. 500 less is most of them would cut your flesh. That many hitting you, like 500, man. Imagine the number, like 500, that's a lot. Like, how is your back anything besides like leaking? How didn't you bleed out? Like, you need to, I don't even know what to think of that, man. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, the, the guy who was giving less just realized that this is just weird and he's like one of them, probably give him like weak lash even then like how do you last somebody weaker like that doesn't like the whole process is just like so yeah i'm surprised he didn't get an infection really care much for the british anymore despite that he does fight on behalf of the british one more time during the french and indian war there's this british officer by the name of george washington who's going around virginia gathering up a bunch of like rough tough frontiersmen that are going to be formed into a militia group known as the virginia rangers he's going to have them go and patrol and essentially use them to counter the french and indians guerrilla warfare tactics during this time period daniel morgan gets even more guerrilla warfare experience and it all comes to a head when the french lay siege to fort edwards in what is now west virginia 
Virginia. So Morgan and his guys get sent up there to help out. That's what they're doing. They're inside the fort. And then one day somebody has got to deliver a message to another part of the military. So Morgan and one other guy are going to ride out and do it. So they leave the fort. They're making their way there. They get ambushed by some native Americans fighting on behalf of the French. The ambush is over pretty much as soon as it began. The native Americans pop up and fire at the two riders. Morgan's other rider is killed immediately when he's struck with a musket ball. Morgan should be dead too, because he also got hit, but the musket ball hit him directly in the neck and traveled behind his jawbone and out his mouth, blowing out most of his teeth on the left side and giving him a large gash that you can even see in most of his portrait paintings for the rest of his life. At this point, Morgan's jacked up. He has no idea what's going on. The world's spinning. The horse doesn't know what to do. And it's just going in circles like this, trying to figure out what's going on. Morgan, after a couple of seconds, regains enough common sense to realize he doesn't know where he That is so lucky, right? So because if he had like bit uh, inside the neck, there's a higher chance he would like hit artery or something in the neck. So yeah, he was lucky there. Like it went to basically Trump thing, right? Recently Trump just look at side and he got saved. Otherwise, yeah, we would be we would be saying very different things today. Uh, but yeah, basically like split second lucky. Whenever you see events like this, it's just like, whoa, what the fuck? It gives you chills, right? Like just a few centimeters like that, few uh, inch or so like that. And just, yeah, that's it. He needs to be, but he knows he doesn't need to be here. So he spurs the horse, not caring what direction the horse goes. Luckily, the horse ends up taking him directly back to Fort Edwards. Morgan ends up surviving, okay? Just so we're all on the same page. He's like 26 years old. It's the 1750s. Daniel Morgan has essentially been sentenced to death by the British military and just shrugs it off, okay? He then goes back into war, becomes a guerrilla fighter with a tomahawk and a musket, and then he ends up getting ambushed and gets shot in the head in the 1700s and survives. I think And then he just goes back to living on the frontier like nothing even happened. That's literally what he does. He goes back to Frederick County, Virginia, and just picks up right where he left off, drinking, gambling, and fighting. Yeah, if you cut inside of your throat even a bit, it will hurt like fuck. People, wherever your throat infection is just badly making your skin red, you're like, oh, oh my God, I can <coughs> This dude has a hole inside his throat where the you know bullet comes out basically from here in mouth throat basically around the same area right you get a scratch there but just by food or something it's gonna hurt like fuck oh my god i need something like a alcohol lozenge or whatever that thing is right uh and shit like that basically or whatever like some medication this guy had a hole in it just, eh, and just like sew it up i guess i don't know it's fine i'm 26 by the way yeah there you go people all the time so Daniel Morgan's back in Frederick County, Kentucky. Really the only historical record we have of him at this point, again, is the court records and the general store records out of Winchester. Uh, same thing. He's getting in bar fights. He's drinking. He's gambling. He's doing what he does. Okay. Now, despite what I said earlier about being very hard to get arrested in Virginia in the 1700s, he does manage to do it on several occasions. In 1760, he actually steals a horse and a cart and being a horse thief back then is kind of a big deal. So he does get arrested. He gets ordered to pay back the horse. I mean, it's like if you, if you steal a lamb, Lamborghini today, you're going to be in big trouble. So eh, kind of same thing. Horse is like, a yeah, it's not just Lamborghini. What if Lamborghini was also like a transport truck, right? There's double arresting right now, right? So basically same thing because that horse is like not just transportation, could also like carry goods and shit. That's a big deal. That's a, com that's a thing that people need, right? And then the very next year in 1761, he gets arrested again because he burns down the tobacco shack of a man by the name of Jeremiah Wood. Now, I don't know the circumstances that led up to this happening, but it did happen. And Daniel Morgan proves to be the main character yet again, because Daniel Morgan goes into court and pleads guilty. He walks in in front of a judge and a jury and he's like, yeah, I did that. And the judge and the jury are like, I don't believe you. You're innocent. And Morgan's just like, Dope. All right. Then a couple years after that, in 1763, he apparently changes it up and starts looking for a wife because according to the Winchester General Store ledger, there was approximately three women all using Daniel Morgan's credit line to buy lingerie, chocolates, and other small items. And by the next year, 1764, that number had dwindled down to just one, a lady by the name of Abigail Curry, who would go on to become his wife, and they would have two daughters, Nancy and Betsy. Okay, now what's important to understand about his wife, Abigail, is that socially speaking, she's way out of Daniel Morgan's league. 
League. She is the daughter of a pretty wealthy farmer in the area, and that's a big deal because like how you get social status at this point in time is owning land, and her father owns a ton of it. Whereas Daniel Morgan is just like the bad boy horse thief with the scar on his face and the scars all over his back and he's just this huge monster of a man. But simply bagging and marrying the rich girl wasn't enough for Daniel Morgan. He wanted to start climbing that social ladder and the only way he could do that was to become a landowner. The problem is he made more money running his wagon than he ever would be able to as a farmer, but he ends up buying land anyways just for the social aspect of getting to say that he's a landowner so that he can start working. That's a big deal, right? Uh, yeah, hell, it's even a big deal today. Like, uh, what are you kidding, right? If you if you can buy a house, even in America, right? If you can buy a house and big land, would you not do that? Come on, it's like it's a thing you own now, and it's it will always be valuable, right? So it's even valuable today. But yeah, back then it's like that's the only thing people had, right? Nowadays people like buy cars and this luxury shit. Oh, look at look at all the things. Oh, look at my iPhone Pro and whatever. Look at I have this and I have this Apple this, Apple that. I have this car, I have Lamborghini and shit like that. People flex like that, but back then there was nothing like this. So landowner, there you go. If you don't own land, who are you? You're nobody. You're just basically a vagrant, basically just walking from place to place. So it just makes sense. So if you have money, you have to buy land back then. And it, it, it even gives you like a power and a foothold, like you're somebody, right? If you're land, you're tethered to that and things around it and people around it. Right, even the people in power. If you don't land, like you are, you are something today. You're nothing tomorrow. It's just like doesn't matter. Working his way up that social ladder, even if it ends up costing him money in the long run. And the reason I bring this up is because it's going to be important to understand that Daniel Morgan has this chip on his shoulder for the rest of his life. Okay, he's not some wealthy aristocrat. He doesn't come from a good family. He's socially speaking at the bottom of the totem pole. It's going to be that rags to riches story, and it's going to be a chip on Morgan's shoulder for his entire life that he wants more and more status all the time. So that's what he works on for like the next ten years of his life: getting more and more money, getting more and more land, becoming a bigger and bigger fixture in the community so that he gets that social respect. Then by April 1775, the battles of Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world. America is now fighting a revolution against the British and Daniel Morgan is all for it. Then two months later, June 1775, the Continental Congress requests the formation of 10 rifle companies to go and help George Washington fight in Boston. And one of those rifle companies is to come from Frederick County, Virginia. So the Frederick County officials meet up. They're going to end up recruiting the 96 men that are going to comprise this rifle company. And then they have to decide who's going to be the officer to lead these men into battle. So Daniel Morgan volunteers, right? Why not? He already doesn't like the British. He wants to fight him anyways. And if he does it as an officer, it's going to raise his social status. So it's a win-win for Daniel Morgan. And the Frederick County officials are like, oh, oh, Daniel Morgan, the six foot two land owning giant that's apparently unkillable wants to lead our men into battle. Yeah. You can have the job. Okay, a little bit of important context. I need you to understand these guys are basically like militia. Like if you think of Revolutionary War militia, that's what these guys look like. They're running around. They're a bunch of rough, tough Virginia frontiersmen. They've got Kentucky rifles. They don't have muskets. They've got tomahawks because most of them are French and Indian war veterans. They've got knives for scalping the enemies. They're running around in hunting shirts, not army uniforms. However, they're technically not militia because they are authorized and sanctioned by the Continental Congress and they're allegedly going to be paid by the Continental Congress as well. So while they are functionally militia, they're technically part of the Continental Army. And the reason I bring this up at all is because Daniel Morgan is going to get a lot more notoriety as an officer of the Continental Army as opposed to a militia officer. Because of that, Daniel Morgan doesn't just want to do it. He's going to set a tone right out of the gate. There's 10 rifle companies getting sent up to Boston to help George Washington. He wants to be the first one there. So Daniel Morgan and his rifle company set out and they travel 23 miles a day on average for 21 days straight, covering 484 miles to Boston. And they are the first ones there by over a week. Okay, if you've never been in the military or ruck marched or anything, traveling 23 miles a day for 21 days straight is fucking crazy, okay? That's the equivalent of running a marathon and then some every single day, except you also have all of the stuff that you need to live on your back as well. You're carrying a gun, you have all your clothes, all your ammunition, food, the whole shebang, and you're carrying it the entire time. It's crazy. Who's gonna carry the boats? So is making it to Boston in 21 days and not losing a single- Yeah, I'm imagining him being like gawking psych. <laughs> You don't know me, son. You don't know me. Like, what the fuck? Everybody walk. This is insane, man. Okay, I get it. Like, you know, like Daniel having this kind of like a spirit and energy. I already made sure everybody else does as well. And just like, made sure everybody gets that in time. That's some next level shit.
single man impressive? Absolutely. Does it make Daniel Morgan look good? Absolutely. Does it violate the cardinal rule in the military of never be the first one to do anything? Absolutely. So because Daniel Morgan's rifle company was the first one there, they get the unique privilege of being voluntold that they're going to get attached. <laughs> George was just like, oh, look at that, look at their spirit. They're, they're weak early. Come here, come here. I have a job for you. You're going to love this. This mission to go invade Canada. Actually, the second and third fastest rifle companies also got attached to this mission. But the point stands. Never make the podium, okay? Just aim for middle of the pack. Okay, real quick, oversimplified explanation of this mission. George Washington has this new hotshot young officer that he regards as a strategic military genius, and his name is Benedict Arnold. And basically what Benedict Arnold has come up with is a plan of being like, hey, America's got 13 colonies. We've declared our independence from Great Britain. We're now fighting about it. Hear me out. Since we just got started with the fighting, what if we strike first? What if we go, we invade Canada, we take over Quebec, and we declare it the 14th colony of the United States of America? That way, the English rather than trying to fight the 13 colonies, is immediately focused on fighting the 14th colony to reclaim what we most recently took, and then we can divert all of our resources there and duke it out away from home. In addition to that, it's also going to put the British in the new mindset of, oh shit. Yeah, because British definitely don't have a history of warfare and just like, isn't going to see through that. They are all going to be considered the 14th one, yeah. Not like British is going to have a lot of resources and things and manpower. We're the ones playing defense. We're not playing offense. We need to defend all of our other areas touching the 13 colonies so they don't attack those as well. So honestly, it's a really good plan. And then reality sets in and it is pretty much a shit show like the entire time. They set off with about 1,100 men. There's three Virginia Rifle Companies and then a bunch of other Continental Army companies together. And the Virginia Rifle Companies kind of are like, hey, we were more or less commissioned by Congress. We were raised to be here. We're separate from this chain of command under this Benedict Arnold guy. We don't really want to associate with him. We only want to take our orders from Daniel Morgan, at which point Daniel Morgan, always being starving for social status, is like, I mean, hey, the boys want to take orders from me, not you, to which Benedict Arnold, just trying to keep everybody together, is like, fuck, okay, fine, I don't care. Just take your three rifle companies, you spearhead, you can be our scouts, that's what you're good at anyways. But that's the least of their worries because the entire journey into Canada is pretty much an unmitigated disaster. Almost the entire force ends up getting dysentery from drinking unpurified water. They end up losing most of their food and medical supplies crossing rivers. And by the time they make it there, they're literally starving. I'm not like, not like they were low on food. Yeah, that's the classic case of you can just like group together people and there you go that's my army now even if they've experienced like you need like you need the element of like working together and like working shit out right logistics you need to figure that out there you go and they were rationing and they were really hungry. Like, no, there's multiple accounts of men boiling shoe leather and eating it, starving. By the time they reached Quebec, the army that had left of 1,100 people had dwindled down to 600 between illness, death, and dudes just straight up leaving and going home because this sucks. So the army's essentially cut in half already before the battles even started, and the half that remains is pretty beat up, starving. Benedict Arnold realizes he's not going to be able to take the city of Quebec under these conditions, so he just sets up camp, writes some letters, tries to get some resupply, and tries tries to get more backup. Luckily enough, resupply does end up making it. And he ends up getting all of his men fed. And then shortly after that, Major General Montgomery shows up with even more men on December 1st, 1775. So now they got more men. They got their guys fed. They go up to Quebec and they're like, hey, here's the deal. How about you surrender? To which the Canadians are like, Nah. At that point, they cut off supply lines into the city, trying to starve it out while they're also setting up a battle plan on how they're going to invade this city and attack. Now, at this point in time, Quebec is a walled city. They have barricades, so they're going to have to end up climbing or breaking through these barricades to get into the city and take it over. The battle strategy that they come up with is that Benedict Arnold's men are going to attack one barricade, and Major General Montgomery's men are going to attack another barricade, and they're going to meet in the middle and then take the remainder of the city. Okay, now fast forward the night of December 30th, 1775. It is the first snow of the year, and that is when the the Americans decide to attack. Focusing in on Daniel Morgan and Benedict Arnold's men, the barricade that they are attacking, they have a bunch of ladders and they're going to scale over the top of it. So they go rushing in, Daniel Morgan and Benedict Arnold, both kind of known for being out in front of their guys. Benedict Arnold immediately takes a musket ball directly to the leg, drops him out of the fight completely. Now Daniel Morgan is running the show all by himself. So Daniel Morgan and his men go, they end up getting a ladder on top of this barricade. Daniel Morgan's the first, first guy up the yeah, as soon as Benedict got shot, it's Daniel's like, ah, just like gasping with like joy and just like, why are you laughing? No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. Now I'm in charge now. There you go. 
ladder. Right as he reaches the top, the British fire muskets and the blast burns his face from the heat and knocks him off the ladder, falls down to the bottom, flat on his back, immediately gets back up, and he is now the second man up the ladder after himself. And this time he goes, jumps over the barricade, falls the other direction, lands on top of a cannon on the ground floor, and messes up his back. He immediately pulls himself underneath the cannon as the British are trying to stab him with bayonets to give himself a few more seconds to recapture his composure and get some more Americans over the wall to start fighting. More men come rushing in they start fighting there's only 30 british soldiers manning this barricade they end up surrendering just a few minutes later from there all the americans come rushing in they're fighting in the city house by house building by building they're literally doing cqb with kentucky rifles and muskets it's crazy but things are going good for daniel morgan and his guys they're taking everything over finally they make it to the rendezvous point where they're supposed to meet up with major general montgomery and he's not there yet but all the other officers on the mission primarily the ones that were working under benedict arnold are like actually i think that we should stay here and follow orders and you know do what we were told because you know i don't think we have enough guys to be able to secure all the prisoners that we've taken while also advancing on the city and blah 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 blah. so daniel morgan's kind of outvoted and he doesn't want to like put this huge rift between the forces so he's like fuck it fine i guess we'll sit here on our hands for a couple minutes and a couple minutes turns into a couple hours and then it turns into like half the day as they're just sitting here waiting for Major General Morgan and his guys to show up. What they don't know at the time is that Major General Morgan and his guys, when they launched their attack on their barricade, Major General Morgan was shot and killed on the spot, forcing them to pull back, at which point his second and third in command launched a second attack and his second and third in command also died. And then the third and fourth in command are like, fuck this, we're going home. They're not coming at all. No, 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 no. Hell no. So Morgan and his guys are just chilling in some buildings and houses trying to stay out of the storm. And then eventually they notice that, oh, hey, that barricade that we took over earlier is it's it's shut now. And there's guys with red coats at the top of it. Did we not leave guards on the entry? You've oh, my God. Oh, my God. This can't this can't be happening. This is some next level shit. They attack a place to call that place. Daniel actually fucked up his back doing that. <laughs> they, they went back to random points like, okay, that's secure. Let's not worry about that. I'm sure that general guy is coming. Oh, by the way, he's not coming. They're just chilling on this building. Oh, by the way, they're back there. Respawn. The enemy respawned. The NPCs just respawned there with the red coats and just looking at the distance, people with red coats standing there. This is some next level shit, man. When he said shit, so like he really meant it. Every way that we took over. No, we didn't. Fuck. Daniel Morgan is now beyond pissed. He knew he should have been sitting there waiting for backup to come and he should have just kept pressing forward. He would have taken over the yeah, entire- that, 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 There's your answer right there. Of all the stories factors and covered, yeah, the, the main character never backs down. He always breaks the rules and shit. That's what Daniel should have done. He, he was the main character. He just didn't know it. Like, I'm not supposed to like wait here. Screw the orders. I'm doing what I want to do city by now but he went against his instinct to listen to everybody else and now it has shot them in the foot he grabs his men and they all go marching back to the original barricade as they come marching up a british naval officer walks out on top of the barricade he opens the door him and some guards come out and this naval officer that allegedly has the name anderson yells down to morgan and his men surrender your arms to which morgan immediately shoulders his kentucky rifle and shoots that guy directly in the face Immediately, the men come running up with the ladders. It is a full-scale assault on the barricade. Now, going the other way, they end up getting driven back, and then they try again. They get driven back again, at which point they retreat back into the city, and they're doing more CQB with rifles and muskets for hours, and then eventually, they get completely surrounded, and they have nowhere to go. At this point, the American men start surrendering one by one, small batch by small batch, and Daniel Morgan remains as the sole American that is yet to surrender, and he refuses to do so. So they end up getting Daniel Morgan like separated from all the other Americans and they have him surrounded and they get him backed up to a wall. Just a bunch of British troops with muskets and bayonets all pointed at Daniel Morgan. Daniel Morgan's standing there with his saber refusing to surrender. The British are like, put down your sword. And he's like, which one of you is going to come take it from me? And remember, Daniel Morgan's like a six foot two giant with a sword basically being like, Who's man enough to come get it? And the British guys are like, I have no idea what to do. If we kill the commander of their current army, all hell's gonna break loose all over again. So they don't want to kill him, but also they don't they don't want to go try to take the sword in person. So they're like, shit, 
And luckily, as fate would have it, I don't know if it's divine intervention, I don't know if it's just the main character plot line, I don't know if the British sent a guy to go grab him, but one way or another, a Catholic priest ends up showing up and witnessing this scene, at which point Daniel Morgan, upon seeing this priest, walks up to him with a sword and gives his sword to the priest and says, I'll give it to you, but I'm not giving it to any of these scoundrels. And they take Daniel Morgan and the rest of his men into custody. Hey, and just so we're all clear, historically speaking, this is a complete and utter disaster. This is the Continental Army first major defeat, 30 Americans have just been killed, and another 431 have been taken prisoner. From here, Daniel Morgan spends almost an entire year as a prisoner of war, and it's important to understand at this point in time that a lot of the British military officers and the United States Continental Army officers all know each other, because almost all of the United States Continental Army officers used to be British officers, so like... I mean, it's basically the like, yeah, same people, right? That kind of makes sense, right? Uh, the, you know, that... Yeah. The Benedict guy, Benedict is a British name. So yeah, it just all makes sense. This is insane. Like the general died, then the second of command died, and third and fourth command died. Ah, fuck it, we're just going home. Talking about like, you know, like no structure, right? Go the history you see in all this historical video where like some great generals like Napoleon, Caesar, doing ridiculous shit, but it's basically something like that. If you have structure amongst, amongst your, you know, command, it's just better efficiency, right? You're just better, your group works better. But if, if, you know, if the shit is happening left and right, nobody knows what's happening, there's no structure, doesn't matter how big your army is, doesn't matter how many people you have, you're just going to be screwed. They're acquainted. A lot of them have met. They're well aware of who Daniel Morgan is. They know about Benedict Arnold, General George Washington. They all know each other. So they go up to Daniel Morgan and they're like, hey, hear me out. We'll give you a pardon so you're innocent and then we'll make you a colonel in the British military if you trade sides and come work with us because you're awesome. At this point, Daniel Morgan, remembering the 499 scars on his back is like, nah, I'm good, don't insult me again. And he just sits out the entire year as a POW until he gets traded back to the American forces in January of 1777. So Daniel Morgan gets traded back and he, you know, is waiting around for orders, trying to figure out what's going on. Apparently George Washington had petitioned Congress to end up making Daniel Morgan a colonel, which is incredible news to him because he thought he was gonna get like kicked out or thrown in jail or reprimanded because he surrendered. This was America's first surrender and it was technically his fault under his command. He was not expecting good news when he got least back to the Americans, but he ended up getting made a colonel. So at this point, Daniel Morgan is pumped, right? He's going to get to go fight the British again. He's got a promotion. Everything's going great. George Washington says, hey, I stood up this new unit. It's called the Provisional Rifle Corps. You're going to be the commander of it. They're all carrying rifles. None of them are carrying muskets. Okay, and here's the important context of understanding this unit. This unit to anybody other than Daniel Morgan would be considered a punishment. And I'm not sure if George Washington meant it that way or not, but Daniel Morgan was happy about it either way. Now, the reason this unit was a punishment was because none of the other high-ranking officers liked having riflemen in their formations, they preferred all their soldiers to be carrying muskets. Now, if you know anything about guns, that sounds completely counterintuitive because everybody knows that rifles are better than muskets because rifles have rifling, which causes the bullet to spin, making it go further and be more accurate. Okay, but we're looking at this with the benefit of hindsight. We understand what firearms are gonna evolve into and what battle doctrine is gonna evolve into. That hasn't really been designed or figured out yet. So the common battle doctrine of the day is to have your men march in a very tight formation, shoulder to shoulder, up to another group of guys standing shoulder to shoulder kind of aim your musket in their general yeah musket is just like stupid that way right like you think like guns invent some makes like a close quarter combat just meaningless so more safer in a way because if you're like just fighting with sabers it's like anybody gonna get hit anywhere it's just like animalistic isn't it it's really like you know like gory when you have guns like it's more precision right like uh, in that way but muskets is basically just replacing saber with like human just like you know, march in front of each other just like <laughs> shoot randomly yeah there you go you're not allowed to move or something you shoot then you reload other guys shoot you can stand there reload why getting shot there's no cover no nothing that's insane right but rifleman you can basically whenever you, you rifleman gunman you can use your skill and like you know like cover and shit like that direction, pull the trigger, reload as fast as you can, and pull the trigger again until all the bad guys are gone. And if that's the type of warfare you're trying to conduct, the musket actually is kind of better because the rifle is a little bit more complicated. It takes longer to reload, so your formation is firing less ammunition, even though it is more accurate, but then your formation also isn't as tightly grouped because all the riflemen are trying to get some elbow room to actually take aim, so it's more of a scattered formation too. So a lot of the other more traditional military officers that are more well-versed in the conventional battle doctrine 
doctrine of the day, absolutely hated riflemen. So for that reason, George Washington took almost all of them that he had, stuck them in one unit, and then gave them to Daniel Morgan. Upon assuming command of the Provisional Rifle Corps, Daniel Morgan also gets orders directly from George Washington himself. And in those orders, it says, and I quote, the approach of the enemy in that quarter has made a further reinforcement necessary. And I know of no other corps so likely to check their progress in proportion to its number than that under your command. I have great dependence upon you. Okay, I'm gonna say that again, but slower. Check their progress in proportion to your number, okay? That's George Washington fancy officer speak for, hey, Daniel Morgan, that undignified guerrilla warfare stuff that you do, go do more of it. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that George Washington himself has just pulled the pin on the fuckery grenade that is Daniel Morgan and the Provisional Rifle Corps and thrown it at the British with no orders other than go win. Yeah, so that's why, I no, I don't think George Washington meant it as a, like an insult or something to give him. He knew exactly who Daniel Morgan was and he wanted this. He wanted this special unit of doing the special grid of warfare level shit to surprise British. From here, Daniel Morgan and the Provisional Rifle Corps go on a guerrilla warfare rampage, shutting down supply lines, picking off officers, doing absolutely everything they can to hamper the British war machine. Okay, and just so we're on the same page, because I really need you to understand this, it's a big takeaway from the video, okay? In the pop culture zeitgeist about the American Revolutionary War, there's something called the American Rifleman myth, and that's basically the pop culture movie Hollywood understanding that America won the Revolutionary War because all of the Americans, the Continental military, the militias, absolutely everybody was a bunch of riflemen hiding in the tree line picking off the British one at a time that's not Come necessarily on, true by any stretch of the imagination the continental military of the United States in large fought exactly like the British fought they got in formations they marched right I mean who haven't watched a simplified video I mean come on and even before that like we kind of knew that right I mean this is a special event the this like you know like guerrilla warfare hiding behind like you know like woods and things that works in very specific scenarios and more li mostly like defense, defensive way. But if you want to win a war, if you want to defeat invading army, you have to have like the same tactics. They have like basically warfare tactics that is used that that time, right? Otherwise, there is like, that's how war is going to work up with muskets stood there and fired at each other so the american rifleman myth or the pop culture understanding of the revolutionary war that everybody was a rifleman hiding in the tree line is actually heavily influenced by the militias you know people like francis marion the swamp fox doing what he was doing down in south carolina but more so it comes from daniel morgan and morgan's rifles okay and the key and very important difference here is that the militias are just that they're militias it's literally a bunch of dudes from one area that got together and are like hey i don't like these dudes in the red coats let's go do something about it and they're not expected to necessarily fight by the rules of warfare they're just a bunch of civilians that took up arms and went to go fight i would kill me some red coats I believe you would. In contrast to that, the Provisional Rifle Corps is part of the Continental Army. The men that comprise it are not a bunch of farmers that grabbed their musket from over the fireplace and went to war. No, these are professional soldiers that have been trained how to fight in warfare and then together and sent out to conduct asymmetrical warfare against the enemy. In a lot of ways, Morgan's rifles are America's first special forces unit. Bartags, what is your profession? <laughs> And because of this, Morgan's Rifles gains a lot of notoriety and honestly a lot of hatred from the British because it's a completely different tone, right? When the militia behaves this way, that's one thing. They're the irregular, non-professional fighting force that just took up arms. They're going to do whatever they're going to do. They don't really have any oversight. But when Morgan's Rifles, an official part of the Continental Army, the professional military, behaves this way, it sends the message to the British of like, hey... We're in this to win no matter what, we're gonna get it done. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that Daniel Morgan and the Provisional Rifle Corps are a huge part of the reason that America has the attitude towards warfare that it does. That if you're not cheating, you're not trying, and it's never a war crime the first time, especially if you win. Yep, basically uh, that's Washington's uh, brilliance in a way, right? Anybody else like, okay, let militia do militia thing. We shouldn't have that kind of a thing in our own military. I mean, come on, that's not proper. Back then, people used to say, oh, proper, like, it's not dignified. Washington, I don't give a fuck, I need results. So basically, that got, like, passed through. And that's how it basically works today, right? America will try to, outside this matter, like, somebody just walks into Pentagon. 
I want to do this. Does it work? Yeah, do it. Bat bombs? Fuck it. Why not? Pigeon bombs? Are pigeon bombs going to work? Okay, let's do it. Type of shit. Whatever it works, right? Uh, so somebody basically like, oh, by the way, we can use this atomic uh, thing to make a bomb that's like too powerful. Should we invest money into that? How, how big the bomb would be? Too big. Okay, let's just do it. Like, I, I can imagine some other countries and other people think like, we shouldn't do this. This feels ridiculous. I mean, it's like, is, is the result is there? Let's just do it. Doesn't matter. The guerrilla warfare goes on for a couple of months, and then by September of 1777, the British have sent down an army under the command of General Burgoyne to go south and cut the American colonies essentially in half, which will divide the two, and they will divide and conquer, surely leading to a British victory. This absolutely cannot happen, so Horatio Gates and Daniel Morgan are going to go stop him at a place called Saratoga. And right out of the gate, Morgan and his riflemen go out and ensure that the Americans are winning before the battle even starts. They begin harassing the British, and on top of that, and more importantly, they they end up taking out all the British scouts before they can report back on what the terrain of this battlefield even looks like. So when the battle does start, the Americans are going to have an understanding of the terrain and the British are not, giving the Americans a huge advantage. Because of this, when the battle does finally kick off at a place called Freeman's Farm, the most forward British unit, being led by General Simon Fraser, directly tries to attack Morgan's riflemen. And it is on paper a British victory. Essentially what ends up happening is Morgan's riflemen manage to pick off almost all of the officers in his entire unit and like 75% of the artillerymen and then they just run back into the woods and retreat. But the British did end up taking the land that Morgan's men were defending so they won the battle. Then like a week later at the next major- I love that shit, right? Like I'm still alive so I won I think. By the way, they just basically came in, kicked out us, destroyed everything and just basically retreated but I'm still here so we won. Yeah, that's just basically like trying to keep records of things, right? engagement, Daniel Morgan sees General Simon Fraser riding into battle on his horse, orders one of his men to scale a tree and take out this general. He does, the shot lands, General Simon Fraser is killed. This is- Hello, that's just sniper. Literally as making a sniper nest in top of fucking tree in like long distance things back then. That's so good a humongous hit to the British military. According to myth, this shot was taken by the legendary American rifleman Timothy Murphy. However, a lot of historians have come out and said that they have no evidence to even believe that he was on this battlefield at all, let alone being the man that took the shot that killed General Fraser. However, we do know for sure that it was one of Daniel Morgan's men. While Morgan and his men are picking people off from the wood line, General Horatio Gates and Benedict Arnold take control of the conventional forces, lead them into battle, and start taking the fight to the British, and they actually start winning. And then at some point, Morgan Morgan's men get eyes on General Burgoyne and they start trying to pick him off as well. So General Burgoyne is standing there watching his superior British military falter as he's taking gunfire directly. Morgan's men end up hitting his horse. They get a round that goes through his jacket, barely missing him. And then another round hits his hat, somehow missing him as well. At this point, General Burgoyne is like, fuck this. We got to fall back. So the British fall back. They can <laughs> Horse gone, just bullet and bullet through, you know, like head all together. Everything flies off. Like God damn, you know what? Let's just retreat. That is a sign. As a sign can get, very cartoonish, basically. Ting, ting, ting. Like oh my God consolidate their position. They're trying to figure out what to do. General Burgoyne comes to the conclusion he's just going to have to retreat from this battlefield. So he sends out scouts to start figuring out where the fuck all the Americans are because remember Morgan and his men were taking out all the scouts so they don't know the battlefield. They don't know where the Americans are. They're trying to find a route to get out of this fight. And at the same time Morgan and his riflemen sneak around the backside of the British and they're able to pick off all of these scouts looking for an escape route meaning that Burgoyne... Okay let's just paint this picture. You're a, you're a force right? Now your eyes are your scout. Every time you do something, you send your scouts out, they do their thing, you know the layout, you do basically do your tactics and everything, right? Now imagine like, oh, we are going against like Daniel Morgan and his people, okay. Send out the scouts. And after some time, where are the scouts? Oh, they're all dead. The understand the level of like fear element that creates, right? Like you go against Morgan, you, you don't even have your eyes because your scouts basically, every time they go, go out, they get killed. Because somebody from some wood line or something just shoots them because they see them before anybody else. They are basically snipers, right? So th that's some insane amount of thing. Like, we don't know what's happening. We don't have scouts. Every time we send scouts, scouts are dead. That's what we are, what we are up against.
Goin interprets this as he is completely surrounded and he is forced to surrender. Okay, this is arguably the most important victory in American history because America winning at Saratoga is the first time that the Americans beat an actual British army in its entirety on the battlefield and forced them to surrender. This is the reason that the French felt compelled to back the United States as a whole and go against the British in the first place, agreeing to send reinforcements. If it wasn't for Saratoga, the French would have never have helped and America America would have never become its own country. And while not all of the credit for this victory goes to Daniel Morgan and his riflemen, a disproportionate amount of it does. And this is why the commemorative painting of the Battle of Saratoga, the surrender of General Burgoyne, shows General Burgoyne surrendering to General Horatio Gates, with Daniel Morgan pretty much up front and center being a giant compared to everybody else, dressed in all white. Don't you know you're not supposed to wear white after Labor Day? After the Battle of Saratoga, Morgan and his riflemen go back up north to help General George Washington. They don't really partake in any major battles. Instead, George Washington just kind of lets them off the leash to go conduct and carry out guerrilla warfare against the British wherever they can. This takes place all throughout 1778, primarily around New Jersey. And while all that's going on, a couple of things happen that really piss off Daniel Morgan, primarily that he gets passed up for promotion on two separate occasions so that some other officer can become a general before him, even though those officers were far less qualified and had I mean, that kind of makes sense because Washington really needs specific thing for Morgan to do. If he promotes him, he doesn't do that, right? So he was, the, he was one of the first guy who was in command when they really lost. He's the first guy actually give them the meaningful victory against British that, that really mattered where French like... So basically he redeemed, not redeemed because it was never his fault in the first place. But still, right, like in the eyes of like official record, right, he actually redeemed there. And it makes sense like Washington wants him where he is, right, like you're really, you're not just effective, you're basically winning the war in a way. So like making him general or something is like, you know, like moving away from what he's doing right now had delivered far less results than Daniel Morgan. A couple of reasons Daniel Morgan got passed up for promotion. One, he carries out undignified warfare. Two, he doesn't come from a wealthy aristocratic family. He's literally a homeless kid from Virginia that has somehow become a colonel in the Continental that Army. Matters. He should be happy where he's already at. They don't want to let him into the general's club. And three, Daniel Morgan doesn't really play the politics game, which is what you have to do to become a... In military that mattered back then, like where you come from, like, you're, okay... I guess in politics that would happen like British style of things. I guess it makes sense. Like look at the British House of whatever that is like, you know, rich people club. Uh, I, I guess it understand that when like they're basically like uh, you know like at the time they were basically British just f a few time ago. Now they're tr not trying to be British, I guess. Uh, but they would still have the same thing. I understand that. But even military, oh, I can make you general because you come. You're basically a commoner like. I thought skill would matter more in military, even from British side. I didn't know that that was the element. I'm a general at this point in time. Daniel Morgan thinks that his results should speak for themselves. Unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to work that way. And this is all very important to Daniel Morgan because remember, he's always got that chip on his shoulder about wanting more and more status. He's that poor kid from West Virginia that wanted to be one of the elite. So when he keeps getting passed up for this promotion for people... It's not even that, right? Like, I'm pretty sure anyone at his place would be pissed off because it's not like, if, does he want to have... Does he need a promotion? Does he want a promotion? It's like... Uh, it's it's near an insult, right? Like there there was like a test somebody did uh, with the monkeys, basically. Somebody gave something really good food to a monkey, and other monkey just gave something simplistic. And that monkey basically saw what other monkey got and just throw away his food and just like start to like slam the like fucking cage and everything. Like I want that one. What does that get? guy gets that and, and I don't get that. Basically, same mentality applies to humans. Even if you don't want it, like why does that guy becomes general, not me, even though I'm more qualified? There's going to be that element at play there that are less qualified than him, it absolutely infuriates him to the point that he ends up quitting and resigning his post in the United States Continental Army. So that's what he does. He literally says, fuck you guys, I quit, and goes back home to Frederick County, Virginia to run his farm. And while he's there running his farm, they are begging him to come back on multiple occasions. Everybody's asking him. George Washington, Horatio Gates, they all want Daniel Morgan to come back. And the situation becomes so dire that General Horatio Gates actually rides out to basically beg Daniel Morgan to take his job back in person, right? 
right? Because if anybody knows how good Daniel Morgan actually is, it's General Horatio Gates, right? Because Horatio Gates at this point in time is praised as the genius of Saratoga that led the American Continental Army into battle and turned the tide of the entire war against the British. But in reality, Horatio Gates knows that Daniel Morgan is the motherfucker that's actually- I love this photo as easily. It's the British, but in reality- Look at that, look at the dead like of this guy's like- <laughs> It's all me and this guy's taking right. <laughs> Horatio Gates knows that Daniel Morgan is the motherfucker that's actually responsible for that, and they need him in the fight. To this, Daniel Morgan is like, yeah, I'll come back, sure, absolutely, but I'm only gonna do it if you make me a general. To which Horatio Gates is like, Congress has to approve that, I don't know if I can get it done, I'll try for you, but I can't promise anything. To which Daniel Morgan is like, cool, okay, well, go try and let me know how that goes, I'll be waiting here. To which Horatio Gates is like, fuck, okay, just... Just come back and I guarantee you I will get Congress to push this through and you will become a general. If so facto, Daniel Morgan gets promoted to Brigadier General and he is back in this fight. Daniel Morgan and his men get put under the command of my other favorite Revolutionary War General. <laughs> Imagine him go in front of Congress, but, but he's a commoner, you can't make him general just like him, like... We need this guy. This is not just some guy. Without this, nothing fucking works. At, at this level, that's, let's just comfortably say that. I literally went there to beg him to come back. You think it's just anybody? Just make him general. I don't care. Give him another title. I don't give a fuck. Make up a title like super special general. I don't know, but we need him back. George Washington's right-hand man, Nathaniel Green, a.k.a. the Fighting Quaker. Now, I don't want to turn this into a Nathaniel Green video, so we're just going to go ahead and say that Nathaniel Green is a truly exceptional general and also very, very important to the Revolutionary War, and one of the things that he understands is to let people do what they're good at, and that is why he gives Daniel Morgan the orders to take his men and become a flying army in South Carolina. His orders are essentially to never engage in pitched battle, run around in the backwoods of South Carolina, and fuck up the British's day. And that's exactly what Daniel Morgan does. He gets to it immediately. It doesn't take long before the British figure out, fuck that Daniel Morgan guy's back and he's ruining everything. So the British realizing they have to do something to stop Daniel Morgan. <laughs> At this level, he must have like insane level of street cred to the British, right? Oh, by the way, Daniel Morgan is back. He's like, God damn it. I can't, I don't think I can sleep now, have a beer because who knows who's gonna jump out of the witch wood and his men send in one of their best guys with his unit, Bannister Tarleton. This guy, in many ways, is the British equivalent of Daniel Morgan. He does not like pitched battle. He prefers guerrilla warfare tactics. The only real difference here is that Daniel Morgan is the poor kid that developed tactics and earned his way up the ladder, whereas Bannister Tarleton came from this wealthy aristocratic family and daddy bought him his commission as an officer. So he doesn't really have the same amount of experience and ability, and he makes up for it by being overtly aggressive and extremely brutal. Just so we're on the same page, this is literally the guy that Malfoy's dad from the movie The Patriot is portraying in that movie. Prior to being sent to engage Daniel Morgan, Tarleton was engaging Francis Marion, aka- Yeah, I guess back then people didn't know science that well that basically they just thought like, if you're born into genius family, you're all geniuses, so there you go. You, are you born into the, that family? If you are, then you can get the post, like that's not how anything works. That guy is probably an idiot right? Merit matters more than that. So yeah, and nepotism was like insane back then. K.A. the Swamp Fox, the other guy that inspired Mel Gibson's character in The Patriot. While engaging Francis Marion and Daniel Morgan in South Carolina, he was known to be unnecessarily harsh to civilians by confiscating livestock, forcing people to board his soldiers in their homes. In addition to that, he is also accused of slaughtering a bunch of Continental troops after they surrendered at what is known as the Buford Massacre. Now, that's the American perspective, but the British perspective was that Tarleton was an extremely effective officer, and the unit that he had under his command was referred to as the Legion they were highly mobile and they were regarded as one of the best units in the British military, especially in the South under the command of General Cornwallis. I mean, this is it. This is a headliner, right? This is shaping up to be the coolest battle of the American Revolution. In the red, white, and blue corner, we've got America's flying army under the command of Daniel Morgan, a literal giant that has defied death after being sentenced to 500 lashes and defied death again after being shot in the face with a musket ball. The poor kid that came from nothing that appears to be an unstoppable force on his way to the top. And then in the tea and crumpets corner, we have the British Legion being led into battle by Bannister Tarleton, known for his highly effective aggression and brutality. Two of the only and very best asymmetrical warfare units of their time, the special force- As soon as he said brutality, he should have played the Rocky clip. If he dies, he dies. 
performances of their day going head to head in South Carolina. And it all comes to a head January 17th, 1781 at the Battle of Cowpens. After playing cat and mouse with Tarleton for months, Daniel Morgan has decided he's going to throw his adversary a curveball. He is going to try to engage him in pitched battle, something neither of them are known for. For this battle, Daniel Morgan picks a location known as the cow pens because it's like the inside of a cow's pen. It is a muddy, swampy, nasty fucking mess. And the reason this land is such a muddy, swampy mess is because it's situated right in between two rivers, a location that Daniel Morgan picked for the very specific reason of going against Tarleton. You see, about half of Daniel Morgan's force is comprised of militia. Militia is not good at pitched battle. They're known for firing one volley and then all running off and fleeing. They're just, they're not good at it. They're not reliable. They're not trained soldiers. And Daniel Morgan knows that, so by situating them in between two rivers, it's gonna make retreating impossible, and it's gonna force the militia to stand and fight. And Daniel Morgan knows that Tarleton is gonna know exactly what Daniel Morgan is doing. So the way that Tarleton is gonna receive this is gonna be, Daniel Morgan honestly thinks in his arrogance that he can situate his militia between two rivers, forcing them to not retreat, and they're gonna be able to stand up against me and the British Legion? Absolutely not. He is baiting Tarleton into fighting him head on. And Tarleton is obviously going to take the bait. So the night before the battle, Daniel Morgan decides he needs to let everybody in on this strategy that he's got cooked up and he's got to hype up the men. He's got to get them ready and excited for battle. So Daniel Morgan, the at this point legendary military general known for his undignified guerrilla warfare tactics is walking around the camp hyping up his men shirtless, carrying a sword, showing off all the scars on his back, telling his men we're fucking up the British tomorrow. Bear in mind, this dude is 6'2". He's essentially a giant among men and he's walking around with all the scars proving that he's defied death multiple times telling his guys we're gonna win and i will make sure that this Objection. never Sustain. happens to anyone else again okay the men are pumped they're being led into battle by <laughs> how does fetish and always have like perfect clip that was a perfect clip rock six four it was a walking tall i think walking tall was a movie right there you go this never happens again imagine that scenario there right this giant basically walking around NBA level height, NBA star level height, six plus, and just like showing scars and just hyping shit up. We're gonna fuck them up. We're just better. We're built for this shit. Daniel Morgan, Andrew Pickens, the legendary militia man is leading the militia. And we've got George Washington's cousin here on horseback. There's no way we're going to lose. We've got way too many main characters. So the day of the battle, they're pumped. They're ready to go. They get into the formation exactly how Daniel Morgan told them to. And as Tarleton's forces come up, Tarleton realizes that Daniel Morgan, either in an incredible display of stupidity or arrogance, has stuck his militia in the center of his formation. Unless I'm dreaming, I believe I see militia forming at their center. No traditionally trained military officer would ever even remotely consider putting their militia in the center because if they flee, the entire formation is going to collapse within itself and that's it. Game over. That's why you put the militia out on the side on one of the flanks and then if one of your flanks disintegrates, I mean, it sucks, but it's not the end of the world. It's the difference between getting shot in the arm and getting shot directly in the chest. So Daniel Morgan has effectively done the exact opposite of what anybody would recommend he should do by having the militia in the center and the continental forces on the flanks. Yeah, our War. Fight the enemy where they aren't. After all these years, it finally just clicked. But that's not what it means. Really? And Tarleton, in his default hyper-aggressiveness, is going to show Daniel Morgan the fatal flaw that he had just committed as soon as this battle kicks off. Tarleton orders the Legion to attack the American formation head-on, attempting to scatter the militia at its center, collapsing the American formation, and taking the battlefield immediately. As the British Legion approaches the American formation head-on, the American militiamen fire a volley. The British continue to advance. The militiamen fire a second volley. It does not stop the British. They continue to advance. At which point, the militia members break ranks. They turn around and they flee, just like they were ordered to by Daniel Morgan last night. The militia members begin running up a small hill behind them, and as Tarleton sees that the American formation is collapsing in its center, just like he knew it would, he orders the British to... At this point, they knew British arrogance, right? Like, they knew, like, if, if we make them think, like, shit is happening exactly, they would think it would happen, and we'll look like amateurs, and they'll basically drop their guard, because they, th they would think this, like, much easier. Right, so red coats would basically have, hmm, they, I knew they, they were unprofessional, they didn't know what the fuck they're doing and shit like that. 
bayonet charge, and break ranks. The British Legionnaires chase them down at a dead sprint trying to catch the Americans. They lose sight of the militiamen momentarily as they go down the back side of the hill, and as the Legionnaires reach the top of the hill, they have the biggest oh fuck moment in the American Revolution. What the now out of ranks, out of formation horde of British soldiers see is that the American militiamen are now reformed up with an additional 600 continental soldiers formed up directly behind them in what is now a massive wall of musket fire as the original flanks of the formation turn and box them in and William Washington's dragoons pull up on the rear side of the battlefield, boxing them in entirely. Did that go the way you thought it was going to go? Nope. The Americans open fire with one humongous volley before launching a counter bayonet charge and crushing the British Legion in a matter of minutes, over 86% of the entire military force has been killed or captured. If the Battle of Saratoga wasn't the most pivotal moment in the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Cowpens was. Daniel Morgan has effectively just hit the British Empire with the rope-a-dope. Bannister Tarleton did end up getting away, but with his lead... So basically in the movie, the lot of this scene, this show, basically taken from that actual events that happened. That is interesting. ...region effectively obliterated, the British military was essentially crippled and would never recover. After the Battle of Cowpens, General Nathaniel Green would confront General Cornwallis, utilizing the exact same tactic that General Morgan had created, and it was effective yet again, forcing Cornwallis to fall back to Yorktown, where he would remain until the French showed up in Chesapeake Bay, laying siege to Yorktown, effectively ending the American Revolutionary War with America the victor. America, fuck yeah! Daniel Morgan would return back home, his body effectively worn out. He would be riddled with chronic illness and chronic pain for the remainder of his life. To commemorate his victory at Cowpens and the pivotal role that he played in the American Revolution, in 1790, the United States Congress gifted Daniel Morgan a one-of-a-kind gold medal depicting his victory at Cowpens with the inscription, Victory, the Defender of Liberty, on the back. This is worth noting, they obviously didn't have the Medal of Honor back then. I'm assuming that having... That is so fucked up, right? Like, one of the most pivotal uh, people who secure the victory against the British actually giving independence, making America that is today. How many Americans really know of Daniel Morgan? Like, this is one of those things, like, it, it's not just American thing, it's like everywhere, right? Uh, most of the free countries, like, there's many pivotal places uh, where, like, one entity is, like, so instrumental, without them there would be no victory or, like, freedom. And like their country don't even remember them. Like, what the fuck, man? You're talking about taking somebody for granted, right? Go on like American streets right now, like New York, Los Angeles, wherever, and ask, like, do you know Daniel Morgan? Like, mm, is, is that from Red Dead Redemption? That's what they would say, basically. That's just fucked up. Congress strike you a one of a kind medal made out of gold is on par with the Medal of Honor, but. I'm not really sure. Then in 1794, Daniel Morgan would be brought back into service very briefly to lead troops to stop the Whiskey Rebellion. And then again in 1794, he would make one last contribution to the historical record, aka the Frederick County Court Files, when he was... He was in trouble for breaking a man's jaw in a bar fight when he was 59 years old. He would then get to go back home, live out the rest of his life... Yeah, I mean, 59-year-old giant is still a giant. If you're 6'4", you're like a giant, or like... I remember Brock Lesnar basically having like, what is triple XL stretched clothes in UFC because he's 6'3 and he's just like probably, basically 6'3 but just he should be like 6'8 or something. That's how wide his arms and everything is, chest, back and like cross section of his arm. It, I'm imagining something like that, like big fucking hands and everything. They feel like that, doesn't matter if you're 60 or whatever, your punch is gonna be terrifying his wife Abigail before passing away in 1802. And that is the story of America's most gangster general from the Revolutionary War, the undignified gorilla, Daniel Morgan. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. Undignified gorilla is a thousand percent going on a shirt. <laughs> it's something right undignified gorilla okay yeah i mean i get it like undignified b back then what what that meant but yeah the guy was op as fuck without him like a lot of these things doesn't happen his tactics were basically awesome that they used he was the first one technically lost in canada big loss to like continent army but he was also the first one to actually get a major victory against british like that and basically give it everything the boost right uh, he, he, he did a lot of guerrilla warfare shit all the way to end 
at Khao Pen, where it's basically like boxing things. Basically, the movie had real events, kind of. Right, it might be like exaggerated bit, but like real events in the movie that actually happened. It was from the Daniel Morgan apparently. Seriously, how many how many people actually know of Daniel Morgan? Obviously, people who watch videos like this, like you know, videos of factors and things. They're probably like, you know, history lovers. Let's just say, but like, what is it? Like a million uh, factors and video will get a million or two million views out of four hundred million Americans something. And most of this, like, you know, a lot of this might not even be American who's watching this video. So how many people know of Daniel Morgan? I don't know, sometimes it just pisses me off. Like, these are some key people you should know about, right? I don't know. Uh, but you, you know, history books must have him as, like, one of the key people, don't they? Comment down, like, wh do your history books have, like, significant portion of Daniel Morgan, things like that? I don't know. Probably if you like, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.